which is in Spokane, Washington, within the United States. And today I will be talking to you about my thesis project, The Impacts of Rock Climbing on Lichen and Bryophyte Cliff Communities in Western North America. Cliffs are one of the least studied and accessed habitats in the world, and their untouched nature makes them harbor diversity unlike any other system. Cliffs are an extremely harsh environment because of the many abiotic variables that influence them, including aspect, slope, rock heterogeneity, and canopy cover. The geologic history of cliffs, as well as their geochemical makeup, also make them interesting habitats to study. Cliff ecosystems are often associated with old growth forests because of the ancient individuals, trees that grow there, such as this Thuja occidentalis up in the Niagara Escarpment, which is over a thousand years old. Cliffs ecosystems also allow many species to escape competition and disturbance that they would not be able to escape within a terrestrial ecosystem. Cliffs as well harbor many glacial relics as well as endemic species. And examples of species, lichens and bryophytes in particular, that grow in alpine and mountainous habitats within cliff systems are the lichen, umbilicaria scenario rufescens, and the moss, rachimetria microcarpum. Lichens and bryophytes within cliffs are often the most abundant and diverse taxa. However, they are understudied groups, so when they are included in cliff research, often new, rare, and endangered species are found. Here in the Pacific Northwest, the cliff flora is mostly unknown, preliminary studies being done on the west side of the state, mainly focusing on bryophytes. One of the main disturbances within cliff ecosystems is rock climbing, and the recent rise of rock climbing has especially caused concerns that it could be impacting cliff ecosystems negatively. Here in the United States, we have over 200,000 climbing areas and over 10 million climbers. And in Washington state alone, we have over 8,500 routes. Here in Spokane in 1915, climbing got started with the Spokane Mountaineers Club. And today we have over 600 rock climbing routes on granite and basalt. One of the initial impacts before climbing starts on a rock climbing route is route development itself. Any loose rock is scraped from the cliff face, as well as, in particular, lichens and bryophytes. Outdoor research calling mosses the green menace, as far as climbers needing to scrape, not only initially with route development, but then seasonally, in particular, mosses off of cliff faces in order to safely climb them. Route development is a large concern for the initial impact to lichens and bryophytes specifically, and this photo on the right is actually a student at Eastern developing a route at one of my sites. Current local management, what is included? It is mainly run by climbers and has to do with climber safety. Rebolting, seasonal cleaning, leave no trace practices, trail maintenance, seasonal crag cleanups, especially for the more urban crags that face a lot of graffiti, and seasonal route closures within the state of Washington at specific climbing areas for cliff nesting birds. However, there is no real regulations within management plans surrounding route development practices or any species of concern, mainly because they are unknown. And the local, local climbing organizations that are in charge of management are within Spokane, the Bauer Climbing Coalition, here at Eastern Washington, Epic Adventures, and within the Pacific Northwest as a whole, the Access Fund and Mazamas. My study questions were, does climbing impact taxa cover diversity and richness? What abiotic variables explain climbed versus unclimbed taxa cover diversity and richness? What species are dominant in climbed versus unclimbed transects? And I won't be getting to it today, but I was also intrigued about what route variables explain climbed taxa cover richness and diversity. For my study, I chose two sites, McClellan and Rocks of Sharon. McClellan is a densely forested site within Fisk State Park just south of Tum Tum, Washington along the Spokane River. It has over 100 rock climbing routes, 84 of them being sport climbing, which is what I focused on for my study. It is a newer site, most of the routes being five to 10 years old, and I chose 10 routes to include from McClellan for my study. McClellan in particular is used for Epic Adventures programming here at Eastern Washington, and it is also why I chose to include it as a study site. Rocks of Sharon is one of the oldest climbing areas in Spokane and is, and is extremely exposed and a popular hiking destination as it is part of the Dishman Hills Conservancy area. 
Most of the routes there are 30 to 65 plus years old. There are over 60 routes, 47 of which being sport routes in particular, and I chose six routes to include. The abiotic factors I chose for my study to include were slope, aspect, rock heterogeneity, and canopy cover. And the route variables I included were climbing frequency, which is based upon the star value of each route and the approach distance, climbed versus unclimbed, the level or grade of the route, and the age of the route. For my study design, I completed field work from August to December of 2020. All of my transects were 11 meters in height and I placed quadrats every three meters. I did pair climbed and unclimbed transects, which you can see in this diagram, black being the routes, blue being the placed unclimbed transect. Climb transects I had to scout for and select based on their accessibility, age, and popularity. And for unclimbed transects, I had to ensure there is no visible climbing damage or mention of previous routes on the face, as well as there being enough area between routes to put an unclimbed transect, as many routes often are bolted very close to one another. For my survey methods, I used half meter squared plots that I placed side by side four times along each transect for a total of eight plots per transect. Within each plot, I described and identified each lichen and bryophyte species, estimated their percent cover, and if I could not identify them in the field, I collected samples. In the center of each plot, I used a clinometer to take the slope, as well as I counted each individual rock feature, crack, pocket, and ledge, and measured each of them. For each transect, I noted its canopy cover, aspect, and height. Identification methodology included both morphological for both lichens and bryophytes, as well as chemical methods for lichens specifically. I had over 550 collections of lichens, which took me over 250 hours to identify, and I had over 270 collections of bryophytes, which included mosses and liverworts, which took me over 100 hours to identify. For my statistical approach, I used RStudio and several packages with three main statistical tests. To answer the question, does climbing impact taxa cover diversity and richness, as well as what rare route variables explain climb taxa cover richness and diversity, I created a model, a GLME, and I paired it with an ANOVA and a DREDGE to best understand what variables were the most important to include in each model. To better understand communities, I used an NMDS that I paired with an NFIT to answer the questions how different or similar sites were from one another and how environmental variables explained communities. Lastly, I used ranked abundance to see what species were dominant in climbed versus unclimbed transects. So overall, I did find that climbing reduced lichen and bryophyte cover in cliffs. Here I have a GLME effects model plot of all taxa cover for climbed versus unclimbed. I will start with showing you lichen and bryophyte cover by site. First, we'll look at the bryophytes on the left-hand side, McClellan and then Rocks of Sharon. Here for McClellan, we can see that the bryophyte cover was very high and that unclimbed overall was a lot higher than climbed. And at Rocks of Sharon, we can see that the bryophyte cover was much lower. For lichens, we see that there's a little more of an overlap between climbed and unclimbed, which I will talk about in a second here. However, at both sites, lichens were pretty dominant. And at Rocks of Sharon, there was never zero lichen cover within plots where there was at McClellan due to there being such high bryophyte cover. We already saw that total cover within both sites combined was negatively impacted. However, within each individual site, total cover was also negatively impacted by rock climbing. For bryophyte and plant cover within both sites and at McClellan specifically, total cover, species richness, and diversity was negatively impacted. For lichens, it's a little bit different of a story. Species richness within both sites and at McClellan was negatively impacted and at Rocks of Sharon, lichen cover and species diversity were negatively impacted. However, I decided to take a closer look into what was going on with the lichens. I decided to split my lichens into seven different morphology groups. Crustose, Crustos endolith, Lepros, Fruticose, Folios, Folios umbilicate, and Folios squamulose to better understand how lichens were being impacted by rock climbing. Inevitably, I did find that Crustos and Crustos endolithic lichens were positively impacted by climbing. Their species richness, cover, and diversity overall at McClellan being positively impacted and at Rocks of Sharon and within both sites, their richness being positively impacted by climbing. As far as the other lichen morphology groups, we saw negative impacts 
within both sites combined with fruticose folios and folios umbilicate lichens. At McClellan in particular, fruticose lichens were negatively impacted, and then at Rocks of Sharon, where lichens dominated plots, leprose, fruticose folios, and umbilicate lichens were all negatively impacted by climbing. Today, I will be going over my NMDS results for all taxa. First, I will start up in the upper left-hand corner with McClellan and Rocks of Sharon. McClellan being in green, Rocks of Sharon being in yellow. We can see that there is a slight overlap between sites, but that slights were mainly extremely different from one another, which made me do most of my analyses separately by site. The next graph to the right is McClellan and Rocks of Sharon, yet colored by climbed and unclimbed. We can see that there is still a lot of an overlap, which may be due to climbing positively impacting crustose and crustose endolithic lichens. Next, when looking at sites individually with environmental variables, we see that slope and plot height were both important within each site. However, that at McClellan, canopy cover was one of the most important variables, and that at Rocks of Sharon, feature cover was one of the most important variables. For ranked abundance plots results, first I will be going over bryophytes and plants. Within McClellan, we can clearly see when comparing it to Rocks of Sharon that the bryophyte diversity and abundance was much higher. However, within climbed versus unclimbed, we can still see at both sites that unclimbed had a much higher abundance of bryophytes than climbed. For ranked abundance results for lichens, we can still see that when comparing climbed to unclimbed, that unclimbed uh, lichen abundance was much higher than climbed. And then here we can also see that at Rocks of Sharon, the lichens were a little more abundant than at McClellan, and that in particular, which is interesting to point out, that the first two species, I will use McClellan as an example, within climbed transects, the most abundant were both rhizocarpon crustose lichen species. And then with unclimbed, we have a dust lichen and a foliose lichen being the first two species, which I find very interesting because it coincides with how different lichen morphology groups were impacted and negatively. Some species in particular that I found at each site that I found to be quite interesting was an Henrica americana, which was recently collected for the first time in North America by Bruce McCoon at Oregon State University. Norman Dinopulchella, which is a quite a common species west of the Cascades, so it was very fun finding it on the east side of the Cascades. And the, the only pin lichen I found in my study was Kinothecopsis subparoica, and one of the only liverworts found in my study was Ferlania californica. Based on my results today, I would like to suggest some management guidelines. First, I think that updating development practices is extremely important. I do not think the whole cliff face needs to be cleaned in order to create or bolt a rock climbing route and that not every cliff face needs to be developed and not every single possible route needs to be created. Cliffs with high bryophyte, foliose, and fruticose lichen cover should be reconsidered for development and cliffs with higher crustose lichen cover should be prioritized, especially since climbers complain so much about having to seasonally clean cliffs. Why not develop a cliff that you would never have to seasonally clean because it doesn't have such high bryophyte and fruticose and macro lichen cover? As well as a second point I wanna make here is including climbers in this work, in this research and educating the public about the importance of lichens and bryophytes in general. And so I included climbers in this study as field assistants as well as I am a climber myself. And so I think it's really important for us to be involved in this research. I think it's important to educate climbers on the importance of lichens and bryophytes and, and as well as make sure they understand that when they are cleaning a route, they are taking off a live organism, something that is living. And I think a lot of people disassociate that when they are cleaning a rock climbing route, they think it's more of a nuisance than something that's alive. And I think um, explaining that to climbers will make a big difference. And I also think, you know, in general, creating guidelines for seasonal cleaning and development to restrict the amount of damage to lichen and bryophyte communities is also important to recognize here. I'd just like to take a second to acknowledge all of the people who helped me with my project, 
all of the local rock climbing information I was provided by the Eastern Rock Wall, Epic, John Shields here in the biology department, as well as the Bauer Climbing Coalition in Spokane. To all of the co-authors of this research, as well as the fellow cliff ecologists who helped mentor me and helped me create my study design. All of my field assistants and all of the climbers that helped with this research, as well as all of the funding that I received. If there are any additional questions, please feel free to email me at gbishop3 at